All right. First solo show, and the most important thing that I learned out of that was have something to drink, because my throat is dry. Hello, and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode beta 43 for Saturday, the 8th of August, 2015. This is a show where two lifelong friends talk about geek stuff and whatever else comes to mind. I'm Amos, and missing tonight is Kent. That's right. He had some uh, family issues going on, so he will not be here tonight. And unfortunately, with me being in Korea, it's a little hard to always find an alternate. But we are committed to making this an every week kind of thing, so I'm going to go ahead and take it solo this week. We'll see how this turns out. I think it'll be fun, but we will see together. All right. Uh, first thing we usually do is talk about what we what we did this weekend and or this last week. And what I did is I reintegrated Facebook into my daily flow by killing off the things that I don't pay attention to, or have outgrown, and refocus on things that I enjoy and can learn from. My goal wasn't to eliminate the time that I spend on Facebook. Is was to garner productivity out of it and eliminate the wasted time of simply reading all the trivial crap most people put there. Whenever I talk to someone who's using Facebook, they're going down and they're looking at all the things that these other people have put on there, but they're not actually learning from it. It's typically an, a waste of time, a a way to fill the void with something possibly humorous and sometimes catching up with friends and family, but usually it's just a way to waste time. And... Well, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, you know, I'm about halfway through my life. And I think it's really time to start making sure that the things that I'm doing to fill the the time gaps in my day are productive in something to either get me to a dream or fulfill something that me and the family want to do. Um, Maybe that's just middle age talking, but I really don't like wasting my life. And, uh, you know, that's that's one thing that I see a lot of people doing is wasting a lot of time on Facebook. So I'm restructuring the way I use Facebook because I can't get away from it entirely. There's too much too much information, too much entertainment, and too many contacts and, and people that I know on there that I don't, I don't have a way of contacting them and staying in touch with them in any other way. But eliminating the trivial crap, getting rid of the the groups that I don't partake in or that, you know, are just a distraction... And finding groups that are actually engaging uh, that can that I can learn from or I can pass on my experience with other people. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to use Facebook for now. And I got to say, in the last week that I've been doing it, it's been pretty not pretty nice. It's been it's been great. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about today is our TED talks. Now, this week, I, I actually watched several TED Talks, most of them by this individual, Zay Frank. The one I'm going to talk about today is Zay Frank, My Web Playroom. Now, Zay Frank is an internet pioneer of viral videos and using the internet and using the internet to connect not only to those we love, but to those we never meet. He's taken some simple ideas and expanded them out to its most illogical solution. Using social engineering to explore ideas of sharing experiences, opening impersonal dialogues with his fans, and then he turns out these projects that show the brighter side of humanity. From making, I don't know, Earth Sandwich, to combining dozens of anonymous voices to form a melody to help one of his listeners, um, he, just to get through a, sp- a particularly stressful p- time period, Zay Frank is, is basically a white knight in all the oft times dark morass we call the internet. Um, I highly recommend this TED talk and all three of the TED talks that I found that he's been done, that he's done um, to anyone, anyone who uses the internet or just needs a, a see an uplifting story or, or see someone give an example of what positive effect you can have through popularity on the internet and ways that you can use the internet and the social aspect of the internet to make the world a better place. I didn't really know a whole lot about Zay Frank other than that he's been around forever, uh, that he started his internet fame through a mistakenly viral video of him doing some crazy dance stuff. Um, And I learned a lot, not only about his transition to being the, uh, the legend that he is as far as the internet goes, but just how 
the internet can really be used in a positive way. I think that's amazing. So there is that. Uh, my geeky thing of the week for this week, I caught up on Current Geek, ironically. Current Geek is a podcast hosted by Tom Merritt and Scott Johnson. And they talk about, it's basically a, a summary of the news of the week, the big stories, not the not necessarily the tech stories, but really the geek stories, the the comic books, um, major tech ideas. And there's a lot of stuff in there about the social aspects of how the tech world, the nerd world, the geek world, whatever you want to call it, how they all combine and tell a story. And they they often take contrasting views on things. And it's a very interesting conversation. And what they'll do is they'll usually have a couple of guests, usually at least at least one. I, I, I think they've always had one, actually. Um, but they try to have two guests on there. And uh, they get, uh, you know, the, the guests are, again, they're, they're geeks. They're people not just in tech, not just, you know, nerd, comic book nerds, whatever else, but from any aspect of uh, of the little subculture, uh, the geek subculture. And it often inspires um great conversations between them and the the way they handle themselves on their podcast and when they're doing the interviews and asking questions and things like that, it, it really garners a lot of thought. And, and you can tell that the people they have on there are passionate and knowledgeable. And I think that's really important. And pretty much anything that you're going to do is be passionate and knowledgeable. Part of the show, they will do a pop quiz. That's, I, I think pretty much everyone that I know of that listens to the show. I think that's their favorite part. Um, They'll ask, uh, I think it's eight questions uh, about whatever the person that their you know their guest is into, and it's it's kind of a it's kind of a game. It's not just a game show section of it, but it's it's something that uh, is really entertaining, both in the scoring aspect of it and the way they ask the questions. And sometimes the questions are just the wrong question to ask. Um, it's it's very entertaining. Then they go into a section called uh, forecast. And Forecast, as they like to say on the show, used to be its own show. Now it's just a segment of Current Geek. And I really, I, I listened to the Forecast back in the day. It's actually my, my introduction to uh, Scott Johnson, um, him doing that show with Tom Merritt. And I really think that it, it, it lends itself better to the shorter format. Um, when I listened to the show back in the day, I thought it was a little stretched out and there was kind of a reaching going on, but the way that it, they fit it, it's usually uh, five to 10 minutes. And um, they, they talk about a possible future, uh, something that they've hypo uh, uh, hypothesized about. And sometimes it's completely just ridiculous and sometimes it's very, very genuine. It's something that can actually happen and maybe not even in the distant future. But either way, they talk about it and they discuss it and it's it's really awesome. Um anyway, I caught up on that show. Uh it's it's easily one of my favorite podcasts out there. It maybe maybe top two or uh yeah, probably top two. Um that and, and DTNS. And uh wow. Yeah, that DTNS and stuff you should know, those are probably my top three favorite podcasts out there besides this one of course because you know i love my listeners and and uh, i'm sure kent does too he's just a little weird about expressing it sometimes <laughs> um but yeah i caught up on that this week uh for the most part i've got a couple episodes to go um but being here in korea and not really being a tv watcher especially when i'm by myself uh i can listen to my podcast at work while i'm going through emails i can listen to it on the way to work or when i'm walking around here and around the base and I really do a lot of listening here in my apartment and um, current geek, man. You can't you can't really get as much of it's uh, the game back in the back in the late 90s. We had a game called You Don't Know Jack and it was the counterculture um, pop culture blend. And it, I don't know, it was completely irrelevant or irreverent and uh it was really fun, and it was all about pop culture. The things that you may, may or may not know, some things that everybody should know, some things that only very few people would know, um, but it's always humorous. And that's kind of how I see Current Geek. It's kind of a, a current um, incarnation of that, and it's really awesome. Again, I highly recommend it to anybody that uh, has any interest in in geeky subculture and podcasting. Um, even if you just want to be a listener, by all means, hop on that one. It's great. 
Uh, yeah. So that would be my geeky thing of the week. Um, my during my 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 week, I like to read sources from a lot of different different areas. Um, Medium is a great app. It has a lot of different aspects on there of current life that you can get into pol- politics, uh, geeky subculture, technology, um, anything that you're into. If you're into beauty, your fashion, it's all on there. You can find it, um, and it really it's kind of a, a news aggregate for not necessarily short articles um, and not necessarily news articles, but more opinion pieces and ways to look beyond the surface and really get into the subject matter of the people that are writing the, the articles. And it's from what I, from what I, from what I get out of it, it's not, um, it is not articles that are assigned to people. It's almost always things that they're really passionate about and things that they really love. And therefore you can see that in reading it, you can tell that they're passionate about it because they go on and really get into it in a way that is, it's, comfortable it's not uh, overly techy or anything else and uh, this week in particular i read hank green um i've sp- spoken about him before he's one of the vlog brothers uh as far as the internet celebrities go he's he's pretty big um but he read an article he wrote an article called theft lies in facebook video and essentially facebook has recently become the quote unquote number 1 source of video on the internet overtaking YouTube. Even he really gets into John, John Green really gets into why that is and how that's not necessarily a true claim. And I'm going to go down a couple of things here. It's a really well-written article and uh, I recommend it to anybody that's interested in, in online video and internet presence and things like that, or if you're just not a fan of Facebook or if you are a fan of Facebook and you want to see the kind of the, the other side of it, um, the, the first thing he points out is that Facebook and YouTube count views differently. YouTube, um, if you're, if you're watching a video, there's a certain point at which most viewers of the video will follow it through. Um, typically around the 30 second mark, if you're watching a video for about 30 seconds on YouTube, your average video, you're going to continue to watch the majority of that video right up until probably the credits area. Whereas, uh, so they're, so they're only going to count it once you hit that area. Um, uh, most of your people that bail out early are going to bail out a, you know, 10 to 20 seconds or whatever. After that is where YouTube counts that as a view so that they don't count all the people that just go there and drop away. Um, now of course that's going to be different for different videos. If, you know, you go to a video and it counts every view right off the bat, it's probably because everybody that watches that video is watching it all the way through to the end. Um, Facebook, on the other hand, they count it at about the three second mark. Now here's, here's another kicker on that. If you're, if you're scrolling down your Facebook feed and those little videos that autoplay, don't even have volume playing on them yet. They're just showing the video and it just shows for three seconds. Even though you're not watching the video, you're just scrolling past it. That's a view on Facebook. So as you can tell, just on that, it's a stark difference in how they're counting the views, actual engagement versus available engagement almost. Um, and it's really the engagement that's, that what ma- that's what matters. Uh, especially when you're selling advertisements and you're you know talking to people for sponsorships and things like that and they want to know how many views you have it's really the engagement that they want they want they don't want to pay for videos that people aren't going to watch they want to pay for videos that people are going to watch for a considerable amount of time and therefore see their advertisement or their partnership or their um uh sponsorship through to the end, they're going to want they want the most time in front of the viewer as possible because that's how they make their money. That's what advertisements is about. Well, if you're counting a view at three seconds as a person scrolls through, that really doesn't do anything for uh, for the the sponsor and for their appearance in front of the human eye where where it counts. It certainly isn't an indication of any sort of engagement. 
and engagement is a key indicator as far as people that are going to come back and watch the videos again. They're going to watch similar videos. Um, and that's really what the advertiser are looking for. Now, he does put one thing in here, and I'm going to read it, read this next little bit um, verbatim from Hank Green. According to a recent report from Ogilvy and Tubular Labs, of the 1,000 most popular Facebook videos of quarter one 2015, 725 were stolen re-uploads. Just these 725 freebooted videos were responsible for around 17 billion views last quarter. If you haven't heard the term freebooting before, uh, Brady Haran of Numberphile explained it on Hello Internet podcast about news stations copying his videos or linking directly to his videos, um, most often copying the video itself and putting it on their own website, but not giving him any credit for it and treating it as their own material. That does two things to the person that created the video. One, it doesn't give them the credit it does, and and therefore it doesn't give them the references of all those people wanting to watch the you know more videos like that. Well, where do we get it? Well, they're going to assume that it's coming from that side. They're not you know going to the creator and therefore giving the creator the more views and and therefore more advertising dollars. Um, and the other thing it does is it leads people astray as far as where you can get your creative content. Now I just I know that parallels to what I just said. But if you look at it from the creator point of view and then look at it at the viewer point of view, myself as a creator, I want people to come back and watch my videos. I want them to know where they can find more videos. I want them to be able to seek out the source of the material that I create and find more things like it. As a viewer, I want to know where the videos that I'm watching came from not only so that that person gets credit, but also so that I can have a consistent uh, quality level of the things that I watch. Neither one of those is really happening when somebody takes a video, either either pulls it off of YouTube, which at least they get the view on that part, even if they're not getting credit. But if they pull it off the YouTube, <clears throat> you know, directly linking to it, or if they steal the video itself, actually download the video and then put it on their own site. And therefore the, the artist isn't getting the, the, the views or the credit. Both of those are hurting the creators and they're helping people that aren't actually doing anything other than copying and pasting. And, um, uh, that both of those aspects, both of those are just completely dis- disrespectful to the creators and to the viewer, in my opinion. Um, now this feeds into an argument that I, well, I don't say an argument, an article that I saw a while ago uh, from, uh, Veritasium on the Veritasium channel. And essentially the way that Facebook breaks down their advertising, not just showing you the advertising, but for people that are paying to get more views on their advertising they say it's not uh, fake views and this and that and everything else. But the way that it works out, the more money you pay into Facebook for views on your videos or on your page or on your comments, the more washed out the engagement becomes. And of course, once you get lower engagement, means fewer people are actually looking at your material, reading it, digesting it. The more money you want to put into it in order to get more people exposed to it. Um, and essentially when you see something that has 17,000 likes, two thirds of those might just be fake likes of people that like everything that comes across their page because some company somewhere has paid them to do it. All of this, all this wraps around to the fact that Facebook, while it, it can be a great tool for keeping in touch with family. It can be a great tool for sharing things, sharing knowledge, getting knowledge from other people, sharing your knowledge, um, and it can be a great time waster. I mean, some people really just want to use Facebook to waste time. You know, there's there's nothing particularly wrong with that if that's what you're there for. If that's what you're, if that's the goal that you're using Facebook for, then by all means, you know, that's 
perfectly effective for you. But Facebook is lying to you. They're lying to you on the material they present you. They're lying to you on how popular things are. And if you really want to get into it, you start looking into the different ways that Facebook has. Being a social platform, they have time and time again found ways of social engineering people into thinking they're getting a different product than what they're actually getting. The biggest change that people would have seen from this is a few years ago, they changed timelines to where the default is no longer a chronological order of people's posts and comments, but that it is now a uh, a subjective measurement to where the top posts are the ones that are actually shown ahead of all the others. It's not a, you know, Johnny said this, and then right before that, Susan said this, and right before that, Timmy said this. It's, well, Susan said this, and a lot of people have liked it, so I'm going to put that on top. And this thing down here that Timmy said, well... Nobody liked it at all, so we're just not going to show you. Oh, sure, you can go find it. You can go to Timmy's page and see it, or or you can manually select to go to chronological order, and you can see it there. But Facebook isn't going to show it to you automatically because they want you to hit the ones that are being engaged, not just, you know, according to how they measure it, not necessarily the things that you are particularly interested in. Now, all of this, I mean, Facebook is this huge conglomerate of, of social problems, really. But are you going to stop using it? Are you going to stop using it because some middle-aged dude in the military uh, with, with a couple of kids and a, and a beautiful wife is telling you to? No. No, I, I just told you that I used it. I'm not going to expect you not to use it. But I want I would love for everybody to be more aware that Facebook is not just what you see on the surface. It's deeper than that. They're not just showing you what your friends are trying to share. They're showing you what they want you to think your friends are sharing. And they're doing it in a way so that you stay on Facebook and watch as much Facebook as possible. And as long as you're aware of that, it's fine. But I just want to make sure that you're aware of it. That it's not what it seems on the surface. So, now that I've completely insulted the the, the biggest website on the internet, um, I, want to, I want to go back to something that I found this week that was just amazing. Um, I think I actually might have seen it the week before, but it kind of came... Uh, not even full circle, it just progressed a little bit more this week. Um, there's a group in, let's see if I can bring it up here. Sure. There is a group that, <clears throat> um, there's Rockin' 1000. Uh, they want, they basically wanted uh, Foo Fighters to come play in Cesena, Italy. Uh, apparently Foo Fighters hadn't been to that part of Italy in several years and they wanted to do something that would create an event so big that Foo Fighters could not ignore it. So they invited, as, you know, they sent out the word for musicians to come to this big yard there in Italy and play one of the Foo Fighters songs together. And they did it. They got 1,000 people to come together you know, several hundred drummers, several hundred guitarists and bassists, a whole bunch of people singing. They got them together to do this video, and I'm sure that it took several takes. Um, and I'll have a link to the video, of course, in the show notes. But they had them come together to do, the, to do this song, and it, it just blows me away. It's it's this beautiful, this beautiful portrayal of fandom sent to directly to the group. I mean, they sent it straight to the group. Um, but this week, Dave Grohl, the, the lead singer and uh, one of the guitarists for Foo Fighters, responded saying that we're on our way. We're, we're going to come. We're going to make it happen. 
And the thing that gets me about this is this is one guy had a dream and said, I want to get my favorite band to my hometown. How can I possibly do that? Kicked around a couple ideas. And a year later or whatever, boom, they're coming. This band is going to appear in this this gentleman's hometown because he dreamed it and he made it happen with the help of, of you know, 999 of his loosest friends. <laughs> um, so here's a little, little, a little cut of the video and it's, um, it's really, it's really good. It's, it's really entertaining to watch and see people that are playing the music and watch, uh, me particularly, I like the watching the drummers, how they're all, you know, in sync and it's just, it's a gorgeous thing. So here, here's a little take of it. So there you go. Um, that's 1,000 people playing the same song together in sync in the hopes and uh, uh, dream of getting one band to come to a part of Italy that a lot of people, these, these, a lot of these people aren't even from. A lot of these people aren't even from Europe. You know, they, they just happen to have enough money to pack up their shit and fly out to Europe and take part in it. Um, but I really thought that was really amazing a great fan reaction and a great band reaction. And hopefully when, once the the band actually plays, th- there'll be another, you know, another little video or something like that. And uh, we can come back here and re mention it and share that with y'all. I just thought that was great. If I could get, you know, Metallica and Matchbox 20 and Garth Brooks to come out here and do a show, you know, produced by Dr. Dre, man, that'd be my dream. Uh, can I get a thousand people out to Pyeongchang, South Korea to, you know, do a show like that. That'd be awesome. So, um, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, of course. And, uh, yeah, just amazing. Just amazing. Um, this week's weekly tithe, uh, you know, I, I really, there's so many people have inspired me. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm really going to give, kick this one out, out to just the internet in total, um, and say Zay Frank. And I think everybody, the more I learned about him and his, interaction with the internet and how he's taken it and done special things with it. Um, really incredible. And, uh, if you're interested in, in being an internet personality in any way, shape or form, I think this is a great person for you to look at, to see how an unlikely video can really turn into a, a lifetime. You know, he's been doing it for 15 years now of having a positive impact on thousands of lives, you know, just out of the, out of the creative mind that he has and just putting that out there and seeing what results come out of it and loving the reaction of sharing the, uh, the, the, the shared social aspect of it. Um, so that's, that's where I'm going to kick the weekly tie this week is to Zay Frank. Um, great, just a great personality. So, all right. Uh, th- of course, Kent couldn't be here. I'm sure he, uh, well, he had, he had tons of things going on this week. He's actually, now that he's retired from the military, he wants to go find another job. And well, that, that kind of took up a lot of his time this week. So he unfortunately was not able to be here with us. Um, but if you wouldn't like to know more about him and what he's doing, you can go to ratebeer.com, look up username Del Noche, or you can find him on Twitter at, at RM underscore Del Noche. You can always find me at Ethan Kane on Twitter. You can follow the show at Ritual Misery. Uh, you can submit ideas or a sub on our subreddit if you've got other things that you'd like to talk about or if there's other things going on on the internet that we just haven't talked about that uh, you know you want to hear a couple of guys crazy uh, crazy opinions about ritualmisery.reddit.com you can email us podcast at ritualmisery.com we, you know, we'd love to hear some feedback and see what you enjoy about the show and what you don't like about the show and how we can possibly make the show better um, you can always go to our home on the web, ritualmisery.com. Um, and, uh, if you go to ritualmisery.com, there's a couple things you can do there. One, you can see all the other projects that we're working on. I've got another podcast, the OLCC, the O Lounge comedy cast that I'm working on. 
It's a comedy club here in Pyeongtaek, and we have great things going on through there, comics that are coming through from the States. Um, some headliners, we have another headliner coming in next week. And what I do is I take those pot, those uh, those stand-up routines and I record them and then share them. So in case you can't make it or if you just need, some, need a quick pick-me-up or whatever else, by all means, you can stop by there, subscribe to that podcast, the OLCC. That's the O Lounge Comedy Cast. I've got a couple other projects in the works. Uh, some of those details are up on the originalmisery.com site. Some of them are not. And uh, you can call and leave us a voicemail if you'd really like to give us some feedback and tell us what other projects you'd like us to work on. 567-69-TRMPC. That's 567-698-7672. Our music that's coming in right now comes courtesy of Kevin McLeod. You can find him doing great things over there on incomptech.com. Thank you for listening. For the absent Kent, for me and for you, this has been your Ritual Misery Podcast. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 